Hey guys, hope you're doing well and are ready to get back to the topic of imperfect competition. So over the past several videos, we've talked about two very important markets, which is perfect competition. And the example we used was, you know, we talked about the bakery where you have many, many producers selling identical goods. And they had no control of the market outcome in terms of the price they can charge. And then we've talked about monopoly and we talked about utilities as an example. So make sure you're very clear on the differences between perfect competition and monopoly. And in today's video, we're going to talk about two examples of markets which come somewhere in between the two. So we won't cover those in as much detail as we've covered these. But we will talk about the differences and similarities between monopolistic competition and oligopoly in relation to these two markets. So perfect competitions, you know, monopoly, you know, is, has one firm. Now we're going to talk about two examples, which are oligopoly and monopolistic competition, which you'll see comes somewhere in between monopoly and perfect competition. So it's very important you understand the two extreme cases before you can understand what's, what comes in between, uh, you know, both perfect competition and monopoly. So we'll see that you know in the, these markets, uh, they'll face some competition. Uh, the degree will depend. Monopolistic competition will have more competition that they'll face uh, as opposed to oligopoly. But both of them will have some degree of market power. Not as much as monopoly, but not as little as perfect competition. So there you, you can already see they're coming somewhere in, in between. So we'll start with monopolistic competition. Uh, and then I'll give you the characteristics and talk a little bit about their short run and long run uh, conditions. And then we'll do an example with oligopoly as well. So monopolistic competition, there are many sellers. This is similar to perfect competition. One difference is that there is product differentiation. So in perfect competition, every producer was selling identical goods. Now, and this is the key feature of this market, each producer sells similar but not identical goods. So as I'm going through this, think about examples in this market, and this is going to be the key factor which differentiates this market from perfect competition. And then they might also differ their, their uh, product due to location. So the product might be identical, but the reason they're able to charge a different price is, might be because of location. So, you know, petrol pumps and gas stations uh, in, in, in some cases are, are operating in a monopolistically competitive market in a city, uh, and that's due to location. And then you also have free entry and exit, right? So you'll see free entry and exit in many, many sellers is similar to, to perfect competition, but the fact that they're not selling identical goods is different from perfect competition. So you'll, you, know, you should be able to guess that they'll have some ability to control what price they can charge. So hopefully you're able to think of some examples. Most goods we buy as consumers in our daily lives is part of monopolistically competitive market, right? So books, shoes, clothes, restaurants, nightclubs, bars, these are all examples of goods. All right, so hopefully you were able to think of some examples. Most goods we buy come under a monopolistically competitive market. Right? Books, clothes, restaurants, nightclubs, bars, uh, food, all of these are commodities, beer, commodities where the, what we buy is slightly different than what other producers sell. They're not completely different, but we, there's not one producer, but it's not perfect competition because every beer we buy is not identical or every uh, restaurant we go to is not identical. So you can see that they, can, they come somewhere in between perfect competition and monopoly. So hopefully you remember this from the previous uh, few videos that a perfectly competitive firm faces a horizontal demand curve. They have no control over market price. A monopolist faces the market demand curve, in which case they choose how much to produce and then consequently decide what price to charge. Monopolistic competition uh, now is going to be somewhere in between. They're not going to have no control over how much price they can charge, but they're not going to face the market demand curve either because the demand curve they face is going to be one part of the whole market, but the products are not identical. So they'll have some degree of you know, having a downward sloping demand curve. It'll be more elastic than this demand curve, and the marginal revenue is going to be slightly lower than demand curve, not as much as a monopolist. So again, you know, thinking of an example, if you look at restaurants, right? So let's say you go, you know, you like to eat Indian food, you like to eat Chinese food. If, if you have a preference, you say, I like Chinese food a lot more, you will be willing to pay slightly more to go eat Chinese food. However, if the restaurant you go to charges a very, you know, they, they raise the price by 200%, then you have alternatives. You might stay at home, cook on your own, you might go to other cuisines. So that's the difference. Is in a monopolistic competition, the products are not identical, you have some substitutes, but you have some preferences towards one good as well. So make sure you always think of examples as, uh, as we are you know, going through these different market structures. So profit maximization process is still the same. You, you know, choose quantity where MR equals MC. This is true for every firm, right? This doesn't change. Price is dependent uh, on the demand curve. That's different. Now in perfect competition, price is chosen by the market and that firm takes that to be given. For monopolist, price came from the demand curve. And so in monopolistic competition, the price will be determined by the demand curve of that particular producer. Not the market, but that particular producer's demand curve. 
And then if price is more than ATC, they'll earn a profit. If price is less than ATC, they'll earn a loss, which is similar to monopoly. All right, so now let's look at what the, you know, the outcome in short term and, and long run is. So given the profit condition and how you figure out the region for profit, under, in the short run, a monopolistically competitive firm acts identical to a monopoly. Right, so you hopefully remember the graph. I'm not going to, like I said earlier in the video, I'm not going to cover monopolistic competition and oligopoly in, in as much detail, but you should know that the graph for a monopoly, uh, you know, what that looks like. So in the long run is where you'll see the difference between monopolistic competition and monopoly. Since in monopolistic competition, there are, there's free entry or exit, other firms can come and take part of the market share away from you. The profits are going to be driven down to zero like perfect competition. Right? So again, you can see the relationship between perfect competition and monopoly and how we have the results in monopolistic competition as well. So for example, if in the short run, firms in a monopolistically competitive for a market are earning a positive profit, other firms will enter, they'll start producing what those particular uh, producers are producing, taking some demand away from that producer until zero profits are met. So two conclusions that we can draw from what a monopolistically competitive market behaves is that you're going to have price that's still more than marginal cost, since they operate off a downward sloping demand curve, they'll still have a marginal revenue curve which intersects the marginal cost curve below the demand curve. So the price which comes from the demand curve will always be more than marginal cost. Marginal cost will still be equal to MR. However, the profits are zero. Right? So this is where we differ from monopoly where now we see that you know, if you, so in the short run, you, know, you have, let's assume constant marginal cost. So in the short run, they, uh, you know, they have, uh, sorry, they have quantity here, and then they have price here, and then they might have a profit, right? So, which is similar to, to monopoly. But in the long run, other firms will enter the market, which will shrink this particular firm's demand curve. And I'm not going to draw out all the details uh, uh, for monopolistic competition. But the point is that they'll get to the point where price equals ATC, which is zero profits, which is similar to perfect competition. Their price will be more than MC, but it'll be equal to ATC. All right, so this is where we have the difference between uh, how a monopolistically, monopolistically competitive market behaves in relation to both perfect competition and monopoly. All right, so let's continue. Now we'll get to the other market, the other imperfectly competitive market, which is oligopoly. So let's look at the characteristics of a market uh, of firms that operate in an oligopoly. Uh, let me go through all of them, then I'll talk about it in general. There are few firms, there are not many, many firms like monopolistic competition or uh, perfect competition, but there isn't one firm like monopoly. So there are few firms, which means there's going to be mutual interdependence. So what I do as a firm is going to make a difference on what others do because I'm not one of hundreds. So since you know I'm one of two, let's say, what I do is going to make a difference to what the other firm, uh, how they react as well. So game theory is a part of microeconomics, which is very important. We're not going to cover it here, but if you do more microeconomics, you learn about it. That comes into play when you have you know, behavior like oligopoly. All right, and then we'll see that they'll have some degree of market power where they can have a trade-off between price and quantity. And there's going to be some degree of barrier to entry, not as much as monopoly, but not as little as monopolistic competition or perfect competition as well. So you know you should be when you are reviewing this material. I would highly encourage that you put everything on one page and you look at the compare, you know, compare and contrast the differences. So you have oligopoly, monopolistic competition, uh, monopoly and perfect competition, and look at all of them together rather than one at a time. You'll you know you'll get a better understanding of all four markets at that point. And then you'll have similar or identical products. And for simplicity, I'm going to assume in my example the products are going to be identical. So here's a basic summary. First question is: Are there how many firms are there? If there is one, the answer is easy, it's a monopoly. And, you know, we've talked about examples of you know, utilities, tap water, electricity. If there are few, it's oligopoly. Uh, examples of oligopoly are you know, cigarettes, crude oil is a good example. Uh, another good example is uh, commercial aircrafts. So if you want to buy a commercial aircraft, you, you know, for the most part, you have a choice of between Boeing and Airbus. So they're only two big companies. So that's an example of oligopoly. Now, if there are many, many firms, then you have to ask yourself, is, are the products identical or are they differentiated? If the products are differentiated, then it's a monopolistically competitive market. But if the products are identical, then it is perfect competition. So this is a good way to look at the different markets and how you differentiate between the two. 
uh, between the four, sorry. All right, so now let's look at an example with oligopoly. Uh, because there are few sellers, the key characteristic of uh, olig you know, oligopoly market is going to be that there's going to be a tension between cooperation and self-interest. Again, I'm going to look at an example of duopoly, which is just two firms. What I do is going to matter, and what the other person do does is going to matter to me as well. So we have an option. We can either collude or act together like a monopolist, or we can compete and act like perfect competition. And we'll see what the end result is going to be. Let's look at an example. So a duopoly, like I said, is a simplest example of oligopoly, where you only have two firms. And I'm going to see what you know how you determine what quantity they should produce and what price they should charge in relation to perfect competition and monopoly as well. So let's, let's look at an example. So let's say we have a, a city of 140 residents. Here's a relationship between price and quantity. This is for the market. Right, so price as price goes up, less people buy the good. We're going to look at an example of cell phone service. Right, so there's, there are two co uh, companies, uh, X and Y, that are providing cell phone service with whatever characteristics you want to these people in a city. Right, so that's the example we're going to look at. That's the simplest example of oligopoly. Each firm's cost, we're going to, again, for simplicity, assume fixed cost is zero and marginal costs are 10. So when you're trying to figure out profits, it's price minus MC times quantity. Right, so again, keep that equation in mind. All right, so the first, let's, you know, P times Q gives you revenue. So that, again, should not be new. Having given you the cost, you can figure out profits. So again, I've, only, I've given you the fourth column. And then given that and the first two column and revenue, you can figure out profits. So pause the video and think about what the outcome here would be under perfect competition and monopoly and then come back. So under perfect competition, we know MC equals price. So price has to equal to 10. And then profits are zero in the long run. So what we observe is that in a perfectly competitive market, the market will produce 120 units. How many of our firms are there? They can divide it up amongst themselves. Charge a price of 10, which equals marginal cost. Profits are zero, and that's exactly what we see. A monopolist produces at a point where profits are the highest. So here, the monopolist charges $40, sells to only 60 consumers, and earns a profit of 1,800. Again, you know, 40 minus 30 times 60. All right, so 40 is the price, 10 is the marginal cost, so profit margin is 30 times 60 gives you 1,800. So now what we'll see is, where does oligopoly fit in? And what, the, what you'll see, well, I'll wait. I'll wait to convince you before I give you the answer. OK, so now getting back to our two producers, X and Y, uh, they can eat the, we know that the most profit they can earn is 1800 and charge the price that a monopolist charged. So they would like to reach an agreement, which is called a, colluding, you know, a collusion, where they would say, OK, let's fix the quantity equal to what the monopolist charges and let's, uh, sorry, produces, and then charge the price that a monopolist charged, and let's split the market. And then, so we'll see what the outcome is when, when we get there. So here, that's what, exactly what I said. They will hopefully decide that we'll produce a quantity of 30 each, which gives the market quantity to be 60, charge $40, and earn a total profit of 1,800 split by X and Y, giving them each 900 profits each. That's the best they can do if they collude, all right? However, we'll see whether collusion is in their interest or not. So a cartel is just an action where two firms reach an agreement, or more than two firms reach an agreement, to get to an outcome. All right, so now let's get back to our example. So we know that the monopoly outcome would be where they produce 30 units but now, and charge $40 and earn a profit of 900 each. Now the question is, does X or Y have an option, not option, sorry, does X and Y have an incentive to renege on that agreement, right? Because nobody forces them to do this. So if they are trying, they're, they're at this outcome, Right, so they are at this outcome right now. Do either, and they're splitting the quantity into 30 each. Do either one of them have an incentive to cheat and produce 10 more, which will bring the market to that combination, 70 units and 35 price? So that's what we're going to look at today uh, in, in this example. And then we'll see if Y has an incentive to renege and what the outcome is going to be for both firms as well. All right, so let's look at it one at a time. If X reneges and produces 40 units, now the market is producing 70. Right, X is producing 40, Y is producing 30. Price is now 35, so X's profits are going to be 35 minus 10, which is MC times 40, which gives 1,000. So ask yourself, does X have an incentive to cheat? And the answer is yes, because now they can earn $1,000 as opposed to $900. So now the obvious question is, if X has an incentive to cheat, what about Y? So let's look at that as well. Y will think the same way as X, but if Y cheats also, now they both are producing 40, which means, you know, first we said, okay, they both produce 30 each and they are at 60. If one of them cheats and produces 40, which will bring the market quantity to 70, they'll earn $1,000 in profit. If they both cheat, now the market outcome will be where they both produce 40 and they'll end up producing 80 in the market. 
We have to realize that if you want to sell more, you have to lower price. You cannot just sell more at a constant price. It's not perfect competition. All right, so hopefully you're following the example. So now if both of them renege, the quantity in the market is going to be 80, 40 each, and the price is going to be 30. Hopefully you're able to calculate the profits. Profits are 40 times the difference between price and marginal cost, which gives you 800. So the important point in this whole example is that if they both acted like a monopolist, they would earn profits of 900 each and split the total profit of 1800 from the market. But both of them think that I can cheat, produce more and earn a profit of 1000. But if they both cheat, they'll both be worse off. So this is where you see the dichotomy between you know, cooperation versus self-interest. Right? If both of them try to get to self-interest, they both will be wor worse off. So hopefully you're following this example, uh, and you know, we're almost done with this video. So what we see is that both firms will be better off if they stick to the cartel outcome or the monopoly outcome, but there's an incentive for both of them to cheat because we all like to get more profit. Right? That's the ultimate goal if you're producing something. So the lesson is it's difficult for oligopolies to form cartels even though it's in their best interest. So one thing, you, have, you know, if there's a duopoly, it might be easier, but if there are five, six firms, it's much, much harder to form a cartel. A so duopoly is just a, a very realistic, sorry, very simplistic, but not a very realistic example. The, you know, in the real world, when you have more firms, it's even harder to form cartels. All right, so uh, just to conclude all four market structures, what we see is that, again, perfect competition is at one end, monopoly is at the other end, and both oligopoly and monopolistic competition are somewhere in between. The joint output that uh, oligopolies produce is going to be more than a monopoly, but less than perfect competition. And the price they charge is going to be less than a monopolist, but more than perfect competition. So they're somewhere in between. So from a consumer's point of view, our best option is perfect competition. We don't like monopolies, we prefer perfect competition because we get more, uh, you know, we are, we, we are charged a lower price. And both oligopoly and monopolistic competition come somewhere in between. Right? So you have to be able to understand and put all those four markets in relation to each other, not just by themselves individually. And then total profits are less than a monopoly, but again, more than perfect competition because perfect competition has zero profits. So this is going to conclude this chapter, which we, where we've talked about monopolies, monopolistic competition, and oligopoly, which are three markets which are unlike perfect competition. So make sure you understand all four market structures, and then that, you know, hopefully uh, you can do well on your exam.